Hello, my name is Simon Clark. I'm the EGU Committee Programme Coordinator. And today's webinar, we'll be discussing air pollution. Uh, we'll be starting discussion um, between me and Craig, and that will be followed by a audience Q&A. If you have a question, please enter the question using the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. Um, yes, and I think that's pretty much um, everything. Um, yeah, so the, the questions will be asked alongside questions already sent in, um, and they'll be given to our special guest today, which is Dr. Craig Poku. Hi, Craig. Hey. Thank you for joining. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> I am joining from relatively sunny Yorkshire, and I had to look outside because it was raining earlier, and it's just been a bit of a Literally few days. I mean, that's UK weather, mid latitude weather in a nutshell, to be fair. So uh, I'm not pinning that just in the UK. Hello, hi. To start with the questions, uh, could you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about who you are and what expertise is in? Yes. So, firstly, thank you, Simon, for introducing and um, bringing me onto this. I am Dr. Craig Poku. I am an air quality scientist based at the University of York, but my journey to get into where I am has been a bit convoluted. I'm a mathematician by background. So I did my degree quite a few years ago at King's College London. I then moved up to the North to then do a PhD in atmospheric sciences where I specialized in fog physics. Um, I then dabbled in that for a bit after I finished my PhD. And now I am specializing in UK air quality more importantly, how we can um, bring in new data interrogation techniques from areas such as finance and stuff to uh, improve our scientific understanding in terms of how do we improve air quality. So that's what I kind of do in a nutshell. I also bake and climb, but I don't think that's really part of the question that you asked. So, <laughs> but I just like to throw that in there as a bit of a spanner in the works because why not? <laughs> yeah, as scientists or fully rounded human beings, who knew? Yes. yes. I'm a, um, I'm a multifaceted human that also happens to be a scientist. In a uh, let's zero in on that um, air quality yeah, uh, expertise. Sure. Um, so there are a lot of different types of air quality problems um, yeah. from smog to particulates. Um, I think the first thing we should probably define our set of boundaries on before we go further is like what, what makes air pollution? What, what is a pollutant? So when we talk about pollutants, we kind of want to go a step back and we want to talk about what are known as aerosol. So aerosol are, by definition, small particles that are suspended in the air. And by aerosol, we can talk about sea salts that could, for example, be at the coasts. Um, we can talk about pollen as well, which is kind of prominent given that we are in hay fever season. But then a subset of these aerosols can actually be harmful to human health. And that's what we mean by pollutants or air pollution. So generally speaking, when we talk about pollution, we're talking about um, aerosols that get exhausted from cars, um, from industrial sites, and even things from cooking. But these pollutants can be harmful to human health. And so that's what we mean when we're talking about pollution and air quality. Excellent. So there's, I guess, lots of different types of pollutants in that case, but coming to that, like yeah. ozone, particulates, yeah. smoke so, as well. Yeah, so we've got quite a few different types of pollutants. So the one that you probably, most people are aware of are things such as ozone, but we also have things as, such as particulate matter or PM. And the two terms that you'll hear are say PM10 and PM2.5. But we've also got other types of pollutants that are kind of um, important. So we've got what are known as NOx or nitric oxides or nitric dioxides. And they all impact human health or they all impact our environment or our atmosphere in different ways. Um, which is why air pollution is such a complicated problem because it's not just a one pollutant does X, it's one pollutant can do X, Y, and Z, but another pollutant can also do X, Y, and Z. And it all kind of, work in this weird multifaceted system that is very complicated to model. So there's a lot of overlap between um, the impacts of these pollutants in human health then, basically. Yes. Yeah. So it's not even, it's like, 
So it's a combination of things. So when we talk about human health and air pollution, you find that certain pollutants can, depending on their size, can basically go through your exhaled mouth and your nostrils, which will then end up basically into your lungs as well as into your bloodstream, which then means that if you're exposed to certain pollutants, you can actually then have increased cases in things such as asthma, as well as cardiovascular diseases as well. And you find that the reason as to why we are so concerned about air pollution or air quality is because long exposures to certain pollutants can not only lead to long-term health conditions, but can also consequently lead to death. And so you find that in the UK, we have around 40,000 deaths a year due to poor air quality. And across the world, that really that then increases to around 7 million a year, roughly. And the reason why we say roughly is because trying to equate a death due to air pollution is very difficult. It's usually air pollution exposure leads to, say, poor cardiovascular disease, but then cardiovascular disease can also be related to other impacts as well, which is why it's very difficult to pinpoint the exact number. So it's obviously affecting a huge number of people, uh, both in UK where you are, but also it's a global issue as well. I know the UN has made it um, part of their global development goals to increase mm -hmm. air quality. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also tricky to try and, I suppose, um, attribute its effect. So it's a, almost like an exacerbative effect on health mm -hmm. rather than a direct kind of, you've got air pollution, you're poisoned, you're going to, you're going to die. Yeah, right. when, you, when you say it like that, if it was the case of if you were, if you go into this area that has higher air pollution and you just die, as terrible as it sounds, but it makes the problem a lot more simple, you find that actually because um, aerosols or pollutants come from so many different sources, it's not the case of just going, well, if you, for example, drive less in one particular area, then you're then going to have in improvements in air quality because you may find that the cars that are then stay still on the roads have exhausts that are actually still quite harmful and so it's trying to find that balance and it's one of those things where you have to kind of go well actually if you do see a drop in say pm 2.5 in one given area it's not just going oh it's because actually we put this one policy into place but it's actually going is because it could be due to this it could be due to people wanted to walk more it could be due to people driving less it could be due to the fact that people are driving the same but the cars are a lot cleaner there's so many reasons for it and that's why in like the UK for example it's one of the biggest um when you look at all of the different science challenges that we're trying to address air quality is still very high up on the priority list because of the number of deaths and because of the fact of the matter is is that if you're having long-term exposures and you're then ended up in um, respiratory or cardiovascular diseases increasing, that then has pressures on health services, for example. Sure. So um, increases in air pollution not only has uh, impacts on individual health, but also it has uh, systemic consequences as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it's one of those things whereby it's a kind of knock-on effect. So... That's why it's one of those things where in the type of work that I do, I don't just look at say, oh, we've got air quality we need to focus on. I kind of try to think about it in more kind of like a societal kind of mm. issue and sort of going, how does one impact on the other? How does the other impact on this and so on and so forth? So in a way, like, obviously a lot of people think of air pollution, they think of the health issues, which is obviously warranted a lot of attention, mm -hmm. but then that might also impact economic um, issues as well um, mm -hmm. but that also feedbacks into how we can um, treat the health of people so it's a lot yeah. of interactions that are quite complex including the interactions with um, different types of pollutants as well yes Dif just to quickly clarify you mentioned like pm 2.5 and pm 10 mm -hmm. those are the measures of how size of a particle yes. is that correct yes yeah. that's correct so the reason why we say PM10 or PM2.5 is because particulate matter is, is a tricky one. It's usually a composition of different um, chemicals. So it could be, for example, something like black carbon, 
black carbon could be considered as a form of particulate matter. But what you may find, for example, is that different particulate matters, because of where their sources may come from, so it can come from cooking, it could come from, say, burning of coal, it can be coming from burning of wood. Rather than trying to identify the actual chemical composition, it's just easier for us to know that if you've got one of these particular matters of a certain size, then that can be harmful for the following reasons. But PM10 and PM2.5 are usually strongly linked to damages in so many different environmental situations, but that's the reason why there's a lot of focus on those two pollutants. Okay, so um, the size of a particular um, on a particle, I should say, um, also determines how uh, they might impact someone. So I guess it might mean uh, that might be easier to be absorbed into the bloodstream or yeah. something like so that. So the general, so slight maths here, because you, if you've got a smaller particle, what you'll find is that a smaller particle of the same mass of that stuff will then result in the biggest surface area. So then that means that if you're then, for example, exposed to that, then the likelihood is that it is more likely to then basically enter the body and actually then not just get completely flushed out of the system, but actually get absorbed straight into the bloodstream. So that's why PM 2.5 more in more recent years has had quite a lot of attention. And what you find is that if you reduce your, say, your PM 2.5, you can actually reduce the number of cases of asthma, for example. Okay. So, yeah. That's the reason why there's been a lot of focus, but there's also been some work. Um, so in my department, I'm in um, the, sorry, um, in my department, so the abstract chemistry department, you actually find that there's been a lot of work to actually link how air quality can be really linked to things such as dementia. Um, so how, for example, certain pollutants can end up going into the brain. And that is an area that I'm going to stop right there because that's as much as I can basically tell you about. Okay, so particulates can really have a huge damaging effect on yeah. the human health. Um, uh, can you just quickly give me an example of what um, a PM 2.5 particulate might be? Is that what kind of black smoke is? Yeah, so you will find that PM 2.5 can sometimes come from an original source. So for example, it could say come from say burning of coal, but then you may also find as well that PM 2.5 may potentially be formed within the atmosphere itself. So if we are looking at say <clears throat> fog, for example. So fog in very heavily polluted environments such as Delhi can actually be a, an, a suitable environment for the formation of new PM 2.5 particles. And that's why it's very difficult for you to be able to pinpoint it. But what you find is that as well, when it comes to PM 2.5 or PM 10, because it's very rare that you tend to usually get it from a natural source, so what will happen is, is that it's usually a combination of several things. In the UK, for example, we may actually be finding that PM 2.5 or PM 10 actually comes from, say, mainland Europe, and then it basically passes over. So that's why it's a very complicated question to work out where it's usually sourced from. But because even if, even if in the UK we're not doing these activities, other places may still be doing it, for example. So it's definitely um, an international problem when trying to tackle yes. air pollution. Um, and that kind of really references um, a point you've brought up a few times now about the spatial distribution of air pollution. Mm. So there's definitely places that are more affected um, globally. So I guess mm. there are people who are also more likely to be exposed to air pollution. Mm. And I guess is that more likely in low and middle income countries? Yes and no. Yeah. So I say yes and no, because I think generally speaking, lower and middle income countries do make it the majority of the world's population. So when people talk about the global South, actually you can talk about it as the majority world because the proportion of people within the global South is a lot heavier than what you find in the global North. Now, what's really interesting is that a lot of these um, a lot of these countries are going through their industrial revolution, like what we were going through 200 years ago. 
And so because of that economical boom of increased industrial um, activity, what you're finding is that a lot of the population are then exposed to these really poor pollutants. So if we look at Delhi, for example, Delhi is now seen as one of the places that are, for example, having the biggest economical growth within the last 20 years. However, Delhi is also known for having really poor air quality. And what's really interesting is that the poor air, poor air quality not only has the impact on, say, direct human health, but what you're finding is that certain pollutants um, can actually then result in your surface visibility then decreasing, which then consequently then means that if you're, say, driving and you then end up hitting really thick smog, or fog in this case, you can actually then result in say, having, say, car crashes, as well as impacts on, say, oh, we we're going to allow for X amount of planes to be released at this hour, but now we can't because of the smog that's basically come over. Mm. And so that's why when people say, oh, well, these countries are sort of exposed to it, the reason I kind of go, mm, is because, like, in the UK, for example, if low and middle income countries were the only ones to be exposed then air quality wouldn't be seen as a prominent problem for us to sort of kind of like look into um for the next um say 20 30 years for example there's definitely um some global inequalities but those inequalities um aren't just on the global scale they're also on a national scale as well yeah um and so it i suppose it makes sense that the um I suppose you could say stratified along income. So would it be about those neighbourhoods that have perhaps received less investment or a lower amounts of car ownership might actually receive higher levels of pollution perhaps if they're... Yeah, so it's a number, it's a set, it's, so when we talk about environmental inequalities, for example, so I'm gonna use the UK as an example, or better, I'm actually gonna use the US, because there's been a lot of studies that have sort of looked into this. If we took the case of, say, Hurricane Katrina, what we actually found is that a lot of um, Af um, Black Americans couldn't return back to their homes after the hurricane had hit, due to the fact that the homes prior to um, the hurricane weren't hurricane resistant. And so, and that is due to not only, and that's mostly down to social economical um, influences and you find that if you're in a lower social economical scenario then that then meant that you then didn't have the right type of housing which then consequently meant that you're then less likely to be able to re rehabilitate it afterwards but that also encom encompassed a lot of black and brown people and you find that these inequalities sort of are quite prominent in say developed nations in relation to air quality, what you find is that because a lot of um, black and brown people, for example, live in urban environments, they are more willing to be exposed to, say, um, poor air quality. And what's really interesting is that the first death that was linked to environmental issues was actually somebody who was black British. And so that's why when people talk about oh, how it's there isn't a discrepancy, a dis there isn't a difference in terms of like say different groups, actually there is. The problem is, is that the way in which you sort of capture air quality data doesn't necessarily highlight that in the UK. And that's some of the questions that I'm hoping to kind of address in my research. Okay, so there's a lot of uh, key points you brought up there. Hmm. So there's one thing that stuck out to me is Low income neighborhoods are probably going to be worse affected because they're pretty closer to motorways, pretty closer to centers of industrial pollution mm. um, versus rich neighborhoods, which I imagine would have a higher car ownership, but I guess weren't close to those vectors of transport like motorways, actually, when yeah. you think about it. Um, and probably have a lot of greenery as well. Greenery as well. Mm. Um, and so there's a Stratification, I keep saying stratification, I suppose, like a difference in um, long economic lines. But there's also um, lines are going long, for example, uh, racial lines as well, if there's a history of um, socioeconomic discrimination. Mm -hmm. um, I suppose that um, means basically 
if you have a certain um, identity, social identity, that could just mean you're going to be more likely to be affected by yeah. pollution. And that could extend to other things as well. For example, I think age as well, right? So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think that when some argue, how can it be that your racial identity means that you're then less likely to the, you're more likely to be exposed to poorer environmental scenarios. It's not as simple as just saying A implies B is going, because historically, black and brown people say in the UK were more exposed to lower social economical classes. It then meant that the infrastructures in order for you to be able to not be exposed to say poor air quality or better housing, all of these things kind of come into play. Mm. And when you look at the world majority, for example, you find that, let's take it, India, Delhi experiences one of the worst areas of air quality. When we look at things such as climate change, we find that a lot of countries within Africa are already experiencing quite severe climate change. So this is why when people talk about black and brown people, they're not just talking about it, say, in the local sense, but they're talking about it sort of like the global sense. Mm. I think what is it's now become a lot more prominent that people are now going actually there may be this 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 discrepancy, um, and more work needs to be done into that. And I know that there's some work that, for example, is looking at like how different levels of deprivation. So the deprivation level, um, the deprivation index rather, will look at things such as the school that you went to what class you fall into, racial group, and multiple levels of these deprivations can actually be linked to you then having poor air quality exposure, for example. So it gets very complicated very quickly, <laughs> essentially. Yeah, so there's complexities in the types of pollutants and how they interact, mm -hmm. um, complexities in terms of like how they interact with different systems then, like healthcare systems, economic systems, mm -hmm. and also complexities in terms of how people are affected depending on um, perhaps their demographic and where they live and yeah. the environment they live in. Yeah, and I yeah. think this is sort of the reason as to why <clears throat> you can't look at air quality as its own single, you can't look at it from just one perspective. You kind of need to have a very interdisciplinary approach to it. So as a data scientist, I need to be working with social scientists. Social scientists need to be working with biologists. Biologists need to be working with, say, mental health specialists. Mental health specialists need to be working with um, chemists. And it all kind of, you need a team that have all of these different perspectives in order for you to be able to address the problem in a way that is not only going to reduce air quality, no, reduce poor air quality rather, but do it in a way that's not going to be, for example, systematically impacting people who are already mm. in um, a discrepancy due to, say, social economic classes, as an example. So when really you start talking about solutions to try and, um, I suppose, rectify these discrepancies, mm. um, there's a multiple approach to this and part of that yeah. might be policies uh, discussing um, restricting the pollution from its source mm -hmm. but also looking at how um, those are affected or um, I suppose distributed as well. Mm -hmm. Just can imagine um, if a child in a poor neighbourhood um, goes to school and uh, develops asthma or I, I think I read um, before this but it can also um, effects, Alzheimer's, etc., so mm. whatever mental capacities. Um, that child, even if they have the mobility to leave that neighborhood, which they might not um, later in life, uh, perhaps when they're a teenager or older, uh, mm. their ability to achieve or um, in life is limited by their environmental factors as well. Mm. It's not just individual. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's a really important point there because. <clears throat> It's, it's 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 sort of like even if you've got the social mobility to be able to move somewhere else the reality is that if you've grown up in an environment that has already sort of been exposed to these poor pollutants then you're already going to be sort of kind of like at a disadvantage even when you grow up and it's not as simple as just going oh well in that case well everybody just needs to move to cleaner areas because the reality is that you're sort of then kind of putting the blame on the people that are in a scenario that they can't do anything about mm. 
And so when it comes to doing policies, for example, it's not as simple as it's just going, oh, well, if we've got X amount of cars in this area, then, for example, then we didn't need, for example, to just reduce the number of cars. Because there's some areas where you can say, OK, well, you need to reduce the amount of cars in this area and rely on public transport. But then that's still going to have a problem with people who, for example, are, say, doing contracted jobs that are in unsociable hours, which then means that they don't have access to public transport as to how they're going to get to work. And it's one of those problems where, again, that's the reason as to why whenever it comes to me talking about policy um, with some of my colleagues, they just go, oh, well, we need to do X. I'm going, OK, that's great. But that's not going to have an impact on, say, people who are already well off. It's going to have an impact on those who are reliant on driving these types of cars and so if you're going to do a policy you then need to go okay right how can we ensure that we put something in that's not going to have say impacts negative impacts in other areas so it's not as going so if you live near an industrial site and you go well in that case we want to focus on green energy if you shut that industrial site down then you may potentially be making thousands of people unemployed mm. it's a very it's it's one of those sort of fine balances and that's what makes trying to do targeted policy quite tricky. Sure, so it's a complex problem with a complex solution. Yeah, but I, think, uh, but I think this is where it gets, this is why I find it interesting. And I think this is why there are, even though it sounds like it's all kind of doom and gloom, but I think because people are now taking this sort of multifaceted approach, I do think that actually there will be some viable solutions. I do think that the UK will be able to address a lot of the air quality problems that we're having. Of course, we've got the complication that climate potentially could make air quality worse. And that's a system that is very interesting to think about because there are some people who know um, how will climate potentially have impacts on air quality and so I think the best thing we can do is ensure that if we are aware that it's going to worsen it that we also ensure that what we're, we're doing on the local scale kind of doesn't exacerbate that if that makes sense. Yeah so can I just quickly on a tangent from this solutions conversation yeah, sure. just ask like how yeah. will climate change impact air pollution like do we know or do we have a general idea at all? It depends. So <clears throat> um, part of the work that I did was looking at what's known as aerosol fog interactions. So this was sort of what I did during my PhD. And when we say aerosol fog interactions, the general idea is how do certain aerosol either make fog thicker or thinner? is the easiest way to think about it, or make the surface visibility better or worse. Now we can generalize this to aerosol cloud interactions and you've got different sort of like interactions that you happen, that you have happen. So some aerosol will result in you having a cooling effect onto the atmosphere. Other aerosol will have a warming effect on the atmosphere. And this depends on whether or not solar radiation is basically either being absorbed by these aerosol or being reflected back into the atmosphere. So some aerosol or some pollutants such as ozone can actually result in a warming effect. But ozone production in our environment can actually be enhanced with sunlight. So you then may argue, OK, well, in that case, with ozone resulting in a warming effect, that you're then going to have production of more ozone, which is harmful. But then that ozone, then you end up basically having a cycle on that front. On the other hand, there are other pollutants that potentially could actually result in a cooling effect. And so that's why finding that balance is really tricky. So we're aware that climate can actually enhance air quality, but then air quality, because of this production of ozone, can actually then enhance climate, but then it can also then have the complete opposite effect. And so it's really sort of looking at it at a case by case basis. And that's what climate scientists are also struggling with as well, is actually working out what is that balance. And that's due to these aerosol direct and indirect effects. 
which is, of course, could be very tricky in a dynamic environment where the climate is also changing at a historically um, unprecedented rate. Yeah. So, so climate change might potentially aid in some cases with cooling, but other points, the pollutions might get worse as yeah. ozone production is encouraged by water temperatures, which in turn um, will affect people. Yeah. Um, ozone, uh, that's... Does that is that evolved in the production of uh, smog as well? Not really. So yeah. when we think of ozone, uh, we've obviously got the ozone layer that sort of protects the Earth's boundary layer or our surface from harmful UV rays. Um, and there have been studies that have actually shown that the ozone layer is healing. But within our actual layer itself, the reason why we can have ozone production is because <clears throat> Carbon exhausts release what are known as nitric oxides, and we've got an abundance of oxygen within the atmosphere. No. That's the NOx you mentioned yeah. before. So the yeah. NOx right at the beginning that I mentioned, that can come from carbon exhausts, and then we've then got oxygen or O2 um, within the atmosphere, and what you'll find is that you've got what's known as the nitrate cycle. So if you've then got UV rays or sunlight, then you will then find that you then have enough energy for you to then have ozone production. And that then mean, and depending on how much nitrates you have, you then basically have a much quicker reaction to um, ozone production. And that kind of cycles all the way through. So this is why, for example, when you are looking at, say, um, NOx as a cycle, most scientists also look at ozone as well because you find that they're two very intimate. Um, but with more ozone, they then get more warming, which then leads to then possible climate projections then basically being put forward. It, but then again, climate can also then result in you having more sunlight and more warming, and then that cycle kind of continues. So it kind of interacts with each other in both ways. So for people looking to provide solutions to air pollution, climate change or the potential consequences of climate change is absolutely something that needs to be considered, but it's very difficult to kind of yeah. Um, include in any kind of solution. Yeah. Um, can I just discuss what type of solution is out there? From, my, from what you've said, it seems there may be some kind of technical solutions that um, scientists might favour, like I think, for example, um, green infrastructure perhaps, or yeah. cooking technology or something. Are, are those some of the solutions that people so might... these are some of the solutions that yeah. I've been done. So um, I can't remember the exact year, but there was a point where all exhausts had to meet a particular criteria, which then led in a uh, drop in NOx, um, generally speaking, over the UK. Um, in addition to that as well, cooking technologies have also changed as well. So what you're finding is that, um, so indoor air pollution, which is an area that I don't really look into, but it's also quite critical because that can also lead to several deaths. Um, there are some um, scientists who look at, for example, the, in get the interactions of how different heat sources can release different pollutants. I know that they've been put some policies put forward, which now means that certain stoves can't be sold in the UK. Um, the other thing as well is that wood burning, which also was another form of harmful pollutant, a lot of wood burning is now being banned in the UK. So there's really warm fires that we like to have. We can't have those as much. Um, but these are like sort of like the kind of like bigger kind of like long term solutions. Um, what is now happening is that they've been gone. We can't just, for example, just put in a national policy. We need to think about it in a kind of like local case by case basis. So <clears throat> that's the way that we're kind of going about it now. And like in the work that I do, what I'm hoping to come out of it is that I can then go, well, we actually noticed that if we've got this level of nitrates within the atmosphere as well as ozone in the atmosphere, then we can potentially have this type of aerosol due to cooking. And the reason why we can do this is because the work that I do looks at what's known as the automatic urban and rural network, which is sort of like monitoring stations of air quality across the entire UK. And what I'm now doing is I'm trying to basically extract different signatures or different methods to be able to then say, 
okay, so we see that when we have a spike of this, this pattern also happens as well. So maybe we can look at potentially doing localized policy in say Manchester, as an example. So there are a lot of solutions happening. And as somebody who is deemed to be solution focused, i.e. me, um, it's something that I'm kind of keen on, I guess. So um, there's a lot of uh, strong policy um, solutions which can affect um, overall change. Yeah. Um, but it sounds like there's also a need for more research as well, such as mm. better monitoring to try and understand the trends um, in pollution. Then. So I think what you're doing is trying to um, make efficient the monitoring of pollutants across the UK. Yeah, and I think this is interesting because the big one, the big sort of like story that has happened, which is the reason why we're probably doing this virtually as opposed to like, you know, in person, is that the coronavirus pandemic led to a massive improvement in air quality across the entire world. And there was a lot of reports about this, but what you've now found is that whilst there was an improvement, so we're gonna go up because of economical boom or like economical growth again, is now basically gone back to where it was before. But the reason why a lot of scientists have been using this as a case study is because they then go, okay, if we can potentially have policies that can have that same amount of impact, we can see where the end result is. And now what's happening is now some people are now going, okay, if we combine maybe this policy, this policy, and this policy, and this policy, and we know that it's going to have this decrease, this decrease, and this decrease, maybe we can get to a level that was, for example, um, during the pandemic of air quality that we were, say, for example, witnessing. So there is a lot of research in this area. And I guess as a mathematician, the reason why I kind of went into air quality was because sometimes as mathematicians, we can just kind of go, well, here's a number, here's a system, so we're just going to do it because whatever. But actually, for me, I wanted to ensure that the science that I was doing was not only going to be helping people on a national scale, but helping people that look like me, because mm. I'm Black British, I'm asthmatic, I grew up in London, and all of these factors meant that I was going to be more harmed due to poor air quality. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I was really keen that I wanted to ensure that the science that I was doing was going to be helping people that look like me. Mm. Anyway, so. Yeah, so one of the key takeaways from what you just said mm. is that the global pandemic um, resulted in a dramatic increase in air quality, mm. um, and that was through unplanned change. So imagine what we could do with planned change. Planned, yeah. yeah. And I think that's the way that a lot of people are now starting to see it now, um, which is a really nice viewpoint to have um because we can see we've been all been able to see what's happened when unplanned changes happened mm. when unplanned change kind of has an impact on the environment so what can we do to sort of like put some plan change into it and i think that's where a lot of people are going and the really cool thing about the work that i do do is that if we say oh we've got this bit of size that's really key for x y and z what you find is actually gets implemented into policy quite quickly. So that means that part of the reason why I again moved into air quality is because I could actually see that the science that was happening was actually making viable change, which so you don't necessarily see in all areas of science. And I think that's sort of something mm. I was like, the relation between science and policy was very clear. So it really it's important to make sure that whilst we're um, pushing boundaries on our ability to monitor and understand the current and future effects of pollution. We also um, strengthen connections to policy. Hmm. On top of that, also make sure we have a perspective that is um, close to how people um, live and how hmm. um, pollution will affect those different social demographics. So it's almost like three key corners that you need to interact to. Yeah. And I think as well, and this is something that I'm very keen on, and I think that a lot of my colleagues are now starting to get the message is that the public have an expertise that we as scientists don't have and whenever I hear people talk about oh well 
scientists don't really help me in terms of improvements of air quality or they don't actually understand us a lot of the time some of my colleagues can be very well actually we do x y z it comes to very defensive whereas mm-hmm. i go why do you feel like that and you find that by having that two-way kind of communication yes it reaches less people but you find that they then end up being able to expand on their own expertise and then tell their friends and family and their friends and family are more or less willing to listen to them than they will listen to me and that's something that I think not just with air quality but with a lot of science we need to stop doing but I think that if we get the public opinion involved so things such as citizen science i absolutely adore you actually will find that you'll then end up strengthening the work that we're doing as opposed to prohibiting it instead so effective uh, science communication often involves um actually asking the public to communicate to you rather than you just yeah throwing information at them and then get them engaged and yeah. For me, I love storytelling and I love hearing people's stories. And what a lot of people don't realise is that despite the fact I'm a very talkative person, in a group scenario, I'm more willing to just listen to everyone Mm -hmm. else because I'm then trying to figure out how can I expand my or how can I expand my sort of ideas, how can I expand my sort of of thinking. And that's also the same when it comes to science, because I think that a lot of the time you feel, oh, because I went to university, because I did a PhD, because I've done all of this really specialised research, that means I'm the expert in this particular field. But when it comes to societal issues, so things such as the coronavirus pandemic, air quality, climate change, um, those are the three that I can think of at the top of my mind. Getting the public's opinion is so important. And I think in some ways more important than my own expertise, because actually if you're doing science for the sake of doing science, or you think this is what people want, actually it's not what people want. And that's of course important when you come to try and implement actual impacts on your work, yeah. So um, it's time for some public questions. Before we move on to those, can I just uh, finish with a final question? And it's like, if you have one key message you'd like to um, convey uh, for our viewers to take away with from this uh, discussion, what would that be? If there's one key message that I can give is don't feel afraid to ask questions about topics that may scare you and even if it's outside of your realm and so if me as an air quality scientist you wanted to ask me questions about air quality then feel free to ask that space and I think that's really important because then by you feeling more confident by the knowledge that you have that then means that you can then tell your friends and family this is what's happening in terms of improving air quality and it will also kind of just reassure you that actually you are doing the right thing. Does that sound okay? (laughs) That sounds great. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, so I'm moving on to some questions, uh, a few of mm-hmm. which have been sent to me beforehand. Um, uh, one is, um, let me just bring them up, sorry. Um, is there a feedback between local weather and pollution? Yes, there is. So, <clears throat> You can have, so let's take rain, for example. Um, So there's what's called aerosol scavenging, which is just simply the removal of aerosol from an environment. So you can have, so in order for you to have clouds form, you need to have aerosol in the atmosphere because what will happen is, is then the water vapor will then condense into aerosol particles. And then that is then also removing aerosol from the atmosphere. But you've also got what's known as wet scavenging, whereby you can then actually have rain wash out aerosol out of the atmosphere. So if we then link that to, say, air quality or air pollution, you can, in some cases, actually have increases or improvements of local air quality if you do, say, have a thunderstorm. But then what you'll then find is then because you've got a closed system, that pollution will then go somewhere else. And so actually it's still within the environment. It's just not necessarily, for example, the stuff that we breathe. So that's an example of how local meteorology or local weather can actually have impacts on air quality. 
But on the same side, for example, if you then got, say, um, if you have, like, say, a really sunny set of days, for example, you may actually see sometimes that you then end up having like this weird haze that starts to form. Or the, the best way I can describe it is that it's when you see an aura, it's like this kind of wave that sort of forms into the atmosphere. That's usually due to the fact that what you're finding is that these aerosol are actually kind of like kind of scattering the light within the atmosphere, which then actually then has impacts on say, you know, surface visibility. But because obviously of this sort of like ozone production, you can actually then have increases in ozone. So that's another way of kind of like how it kind of impacts. Um, there's also things such as boundary layers and stuff, but I'm not gonna get into that because I can get very complicated very quickly. Turbulence. Turbulence. Uh, everyone's uh, the bane of my life. Um, um, yeah, so actually that kind of relates somewhat to another question that was um, given to me, mm -hmm. um, which is related from the fact that you've moved from a kind of a physical science background into mm -hmm. a chemical one. And this is not really related to the pollution as much, but it was more, I think, how do you find crossing those disciplines as a expert? So I've got a backstory for this, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so A-level results day was very recent, but 10 years ago, I missed my Cambridge grades to do mathematics, which people don't know. And most people think that the reason I missed them is because, like, you know, I just kind of messed up the exam, which I did and everything like that, or people didn't support me. But the reason why I messed them up is because the day before my big exam, I ended up watching the 2011 Tony Awards live, where Sutton Foster won the, <laughs> the Tony Award for Best Actress in the Musical. And that meant that I was really tired for all of the big exams that I needed to do for Cambridge. Now, when Cambridge called me the day that I messed the grades up and stuff, they said at the time, well, we can offer you, say, natural sciences with chemistry. And I said, and I quote, you would never find me dead in a chemistry department, so I'm saying no, which is hilarious, because chemistry is sort of where I am now. So the reason I kind of bring this kind of backstory into it is because I think that when I was back at school, and I think this is sort of like, uh, bigger question about the education system I always thought that chemistry was sort of no you need to just do experiments we need to do this you need to do that um, it needs to be sort of like reactions and everything whereas now I just see chemistry as just sort of a mathematical system and so going to the original point of going from say a physical science to chemistry I've actually found the transition to be quite okay and I only say this because I went into a physical science as a mathematician. I also then went into chemistry as a mathematician. A mathematician, I would describe, I describe us as comedians. So we just kind of like adapt to the system and all the environment and just kind of go with the flow. And what I found is that actually a lot of the meteorology that I did in my previous degree has actually strengthened the work that we're doing because if, for example, they go, oh, well, we found this increase in this particular pollutant due to cars and emissions over this area. I'm like, well, actually, that's more of a meteorology effect as opposed to a chemical effect. But so, yeah, essentially, it's kind of enhanced the work that I've done. But because also I did a lot of aerosol stuff, which kind of dabbled into chemistry bits in here more than I wanted to, um, it wasn't too bad. So, so it's helped, but because you, you mentioned... Um, the importance of having an interdisciplinary perspective yeah. and team um, yeah. when approaching solutions. Yeah. Um, moving from physics to chemistry has actually helped you to develop your own type of uh, inter this interdisciplinary perspective as well that's helped. Yeah, so, yeah. so the reason I'm really key about interdisciplinary work is because I went from being a mathematician to then working in local government the year that they implemented the 2014 CARE Act to then going into meteorology to now going into air quality. Because air quality is one of those areas whereby you need to have a kind of interdisciplinary approach. I'm like, I've got, depending on who I'm talking to, I either stick my mathematician hat on, my data science hat on, my meteorology hat on, or my social science hat on. And I just kind of switch. Sometimes I can switch hats in the same conversation, but you kind of need that. So when it comes to then talking to then the chemists, I then go, I have seen X, Y, and Z pattern happen. Is there a chemical reason for that happening? And then they then kind of bring that knowledge in. 
So actually going into air quality was probably a very natural step. And so that thing that I said 10 years ago about me never going into a chemistry department, upon reflection was very naive because actually air quality, whilst yes, it is in chemistry, it's a lot of things. Yeah, so it gives you new perspective on, or a broad perspective on how to address the scientific problems of yeah. air, air chemistry or air quality, but it also allows you to kind of address the, or communicate towards the needs of other people you're working with in that yeah. way. Um, so uh, we haven't got much time left, probably time for a couple more questions. Um, again, this goes back to the kind of complexities we were talking about earlier, and mm -hmm. it's, well, how well can we uh, monitor the monitor pollution in our atmosphere? So from my understanding of how we monitor it, it is done pretty well. Of course, there are going to be discrepancies. So the way how most monitoring stations are done is you've got a monitoring station that sort of the essentially it's like if you imagine you've got a massive tube and it basically breathes in all of the air quality and all of the air and kind of breaks it down chemically and then afterwards and then it gives you sort of like an output or an hourly mean. And then you've then got these sort of monitoring stations across the UK where you've got, so for example, urban background, urban traffic, rural background, um, industrial sites, and there's a couple of others as well, but I can't remember the top of my mind. Now, it's very good at being able to monitor, say, on the local level, so like a plane, but you don't necessarily know what's happening throughout the entire atmosphere because if you imagine it as a box, you can only see one level, but in order for you to understand what's happening in the full atmosphere, you kind of need to have a monitor station at each level, which you don't get. So on the level, it's really good, but in the boundary there, which is sort of like the entirety of where it's sort of sitting in, it's very difficult to monitor. Mm. But that's why, for example, you have flight, flight campaigns, or you have what are known as um, IOP, so intense observational periods, where you actually then go, if there's an area of interest, what is actually happening on, say, the entire boundary there? So recently there was a campaign that happened in Manchester where they wanted to look at not just, say, monitoring of air quality, but they wanted to look at compositions of aerosol or what's happening in the boundary layer, uh, what's happening with certain sensors, what's happening with this. So it's also improving quite a lot and actually it's also helping our understanding of how we can better monitor air pollution with say potentially different technologies so, yeah. okay and i suppose that um you also mentioned there might be unless this might just be my poor memory a discrepancy between how well we monitor pollution versus how it actually uh, impacts um mm -hmm. the population demographics yes um, are you able to expand on that a little bit at all? Yeah, sure. So in order for you to be classified as an urban background monitoring station, you need to have enough green space or space around that monitoring station in order for you to get a representative, a representation of what's actually happening in that environment. So what you'll find, for example, is if I am looking at, say, somewhere like Marylebone, Marylebone is very popular in terms of the air quality monitoring space because it has, like, you know, a lot of green space, it has all of these areas, but Marylebone is also one of the richest areas of London, for example. And so if you're trying to then figure out what's happening on an urban background scale, but all of your monitoring stations are in areas that have got really good access to green spaces. We you know, traditionally speaking, um, one of the big problems is that people in low socioeconomic classes are not necessarily um, have the same access to green spaces. So what you're finding is that because of these requirements for you to have an urban background station, it doesn't necessarily locate to the same areas that have these highest levels of deprivation. And so this is something where this is where like citizen science can be quite important because you can then go, if we are trying to, for example, do, um, so a lot of the work that I do is sort of like in air quality predictions and in like using machine learning, but in order for you to have something for the machine to learn on, you need data. 
So if you're trying to basically train your data on something that's really got this bias in this sort of spatial distribution, then your predictions aren't going to be capturing what could potentially actually be happening. So something that I want to look at in the future, fingers crossed, is to look at say, okay, if we use citizen science to actually collect data in areas that we are aware have these high levels of pollution, and then we then compare that to say what's happening with urban background stations, would there be a difference in predictions? So that's what I mean about discrepancies. Okay, so um, not only is there discrepancies in how uh, the actual pollutants affect people, there's also mm. discrepancies in how we try and determine solutions from mm. the scientific data we have. We might be following what we seem considered to be uh, objective scientific protocol for measuring data, but actually the solutions we derive from that don't necessarily tessellate with what's exactly. needed in reality. Okay, so final question as we wrap up. Um, someone who's interested in um, air pollution, but isn't in your, your area, in the area of air pollution, um, how can they get involved? Or I suppose a way to phrase this could be, what could the average person do to help? Um, I suppose citizen science is yeah. so the way. If you are, so I'm gonna answer this, assuming that you wanna go into air quality research, or if you wanna just get involved with air quality stuff. If you want to get involved with air quality stuff, your best bet is to see if there are any citizen science projects that are happening. So um, one that I know that's currently happening is in Bradford, where they've been getting school kids to be mo to monitor different polluters. I can't remember what the polluters are from the top of my head. And I'm aware that, for example, they're sort of like looking at improving that from like a public engagement perspective. Um, the other one as well is just to sort of be on like a lookout in your local area. And also like talk to your MPs, because actually if you are concerned about air quality within your given area, your MP should be the representative of what they bring back to Parliament. So you can, for example, talk about that and just be like, what is going on? So that's happened. So that's how you can sort of get involved on a kind of like a public side. If you are a scientist or you're trying to get into air quality as a science area, my recommendation is to just look for like reasonable opportunities so I got this job I am now that I'm in now because they wanted a mathematician within an air quality science space but I've also found as well that the reason I kind of got to where I am is that even though I've gotten here via a convoluted route I've just kind of gone my passions have been in these areas and so I found that I ended up just sort of like following my passion all the way through which is a really corny way of saying it but you find that if there's an opportunity that uses your right skill set, then do it. And also, if you do generally want to get into air quality and you've got this background, feel free to just drop me an email and I can see what I can do as well. So that's like a, a aside. So yeah. Sure. Thanks so much for that. Um, we are now one minute past our time. Mm -hmm. So it is time to close this webinar. Um, so let's say thank you, Craig, for all your insight today. Thank and you, thank you for inviting me. <laughs> Anytime. And uh, yeah, thank you to the audience for attending. Um, yeah, thank you and goodbye.